The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Where we are in science, I'm speaking as a professional scientist, and the wall that we're hitting in communicating our science and, and having things translate out of there, um, I'm aware of a paper that was just published a few weeks ago that on the importance of storytelling in science, and that they, they found that published journal articles that had more of a narrative structure are getting cited more because people want to hear stories. Um, the dry, scientific, just the facts aren't working. They want to hear stories. So I want to share my story with you about how I got involved in this gas leak stuff. Um, and then I'll hand the baton to Audrey, and, and, and she'll take it from there. Um, but I started into this thing about the methane gas leaks as a citizen. This started in 2010, November 2010 for me, walking two blocks away from our home in Newton, in the Auburndale village of, of Newton, with my 10-year-old son, um, who was seven or, or eight years old at that time, Julian. And two blocks away from our home, we came upon a gas leak and someone who was working on gas leaks. Um, Bob Ackley, Gas Safety USA, he's a 30-year professional non-scientist. Um, but that curiosity, what, what are you doing there? You look like Ghostbusters, um, you know, uh, with a metal detector, but it was a gas meter. And that's how we, I got involved in understanding this problem with gas leaks. So it was as a citizen. And for me, that has started a process by which I've grown as a scientist citizen. Um, and come into a community science framework working with Audrey and a whole group of other uh, citizens in a community. And we've defined, I think, a community that crosses all kinds of boundaries to address the problem of, of gas leaks. So from that first chance citizen you know, kind of experience for me um, up until 2013, the, the science part of this developed that we mapped out over 3,000 of these gas leaks in the city of Boston. And then we followed it up with a study in which we estimated that the amount of gas being lost in eastern Massachusetts amounted to about 10% of the Commonwealth's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And so, and then that propelled a, uh, a, a coalition of a, a community to then say, how do we move our political leaders to actually create policy to address this situation? So it's been a really fulfilling thing for me. And I will just say that the science that we did, actually, and what we published in the journals, um, is not new. The, it, the problem had been known about for decades. It's just that it was not known to the public. So we found citizen after citizen in different neighborhoods of Boston that would say, oh yeah, I know about a gas leak. I smell it every time I go walk into the store. And so what we realized is that there were hundreds of anecdotes that were completely in siloed from each other. And once we put a map out there, every, the community, everyone could see the whole thing collectively at the same time. And that was the only thing we did. We just made it visible. And then Audrey took it to the next step, and I'll pass the baton to you. Okay, so um, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to talk for one second about what actually gas leaks are, since uh, net on, from pipes under the street, right? So a lot of our pipes under our street are really old. Here's a close-up detail of uh, Back Bay, a national grid map, very small detail of it. Um, and you can see the two of the pipes running down. The, the 1861 is a pipe from 1860 running down uh, Beacon Street. And two streets away, running down uh, Com Ave, is one from uh, 1882. And those pipes are still in use. So uh, we got some really old infrastructure around. Um, the problem with gas leaks is they're potentially explosive. This is a picture of Harlem, the explosion in Harlem uh, about two years ago, I think 2014. Um, 
And uh, they, as the gas percolates up through the soil, it uh, pushes oxygen out, and trees actually need to breathe oxygen through their roots so they can die. Uh, the, um, and then it's, uh, as Nathan said, a powerful greenhouse gas. If you burn uh, natural gas, it's turned into CO2. If you don't burn it, it stays at methane, as methane. Methane, uh, on a 20-year time frame, is, 100 time, uh, is 86 times more damaging than CO2. Um, and finally, we have to pay for it, uh, because the utilities can pass that cost on to us, the rate payers. So uh, it's sort of just insulting. So when I read about uh, Nathan's first, uh, I uh, run an energy efficiency nonprofit, and primarily we used to work in the buildings of nonprofits to help them lower their energy bills and energy emissions. And so then, uh, well, a lot with Mass Save, which is the state's energy efficiency, uh, you know, state-funded program, or. Uh, and uh, so I read about uh, Nathan's research when he surveyed all of Boston and found those o over 3,300 gas leaks. And there was one line in the article that said that um, uh, the amount of gas lost in just Boston alone totally erased all of the state's energy efficiency programs. Um, and so I was, that was it. <laughs> I was in. Um, so I called up Nathan and said, how can I help? Um, and uh, he was kind enough to loan us his extremely fancy, cool equipment, uh, which is called a Picaro High Precision Natural Gas Analyzer. Um, and we drove it all over uh, Cambridge and Somerville. Uh, so the yellow lines are where we drove, um, or not we, Bob Ackley uh, drove, but, um, and the spikes are where there's elevated levels of methane found. Um, uh, so, and it's sort of fascinating. We found no correlation between uh, income level of neighborhoods and because yeah. uh, uh, they're just, they're, they're, you'll see them sort of somewhat clustered together because neighborhoods are built at the same time generally using, you know, the same infrastructure, same material. Um, uh, here's what I call the, the Alps of uh, North Somerville. Um, and uh, we will be going to, we'll be doing a leak survey uh, in the fant fantastic van uh, with the Picaro, so you can come along and see these on your own um, and do some surveying on your own. Uh, and then, smell. hmm? And smell. And smell it. Yeah, I mean, we can all smell it. What's fascinating to me is like, there was one near my house, uh, I would always bike along the Charles, and there was this one huge gas leak I would smell all the time, and I would always think, like, uh, can't be. Because I'm looking around and I'm seeing all the other people and they're just walking by. So I always thought, like, I must just be making it up. Yeah. Um, but then I called it in and it was fixed. And after that, I never smelled it again. And that was so, like, we just don't believe our noses. Um, so after uh, I s we did the Cambridge Somerville work, I thought, we got to scale this up somehow. I found some arcane uh, data on the Department of Public Utilities site uh, where they have to uh, give a lot of information, including uh, this, uh, which, uh, like, over 300 pages of this sort of stuff. Um, but you'll see that there's actually um, addresses there. So as soon as I saw that there were addresses showing where the leaks were, uh, I thought, cool, I can map it. Um, so I mapped every uh, gas leak in Massachusetts on Google Maps, so they're zoomable. Anybody can see them at squeakyleak.org. Um, the yellow map pins are where the leaks are unrepaired, and the reds are where they were repaired the previous year. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of them. Uh, and this was some of the, you know, uh, really transformative for uh, a lot of people because then they could actually see where the where the leaks were near their home. Uh, near their kids' school, near their business, et cetera. It made the not only invisible visible, but it also made the local, uh, the global local. Um, and uh, then I'll finally finish up with one last thing, which is uh, some other parts of uh, uh, Nathan's research, as well as Margaret Hendrick, who is a graduate st a student at postdoctoral student at BU, um, is they uh, surveyed 100 gas leaks in Boston to find that uh, just 7% of them emit 50% of the gas. 
by volume. So that means as soon as you know that, you know, okay, the whole thing is to fix, find and fix those leaks. So by, uh, through a lot of uh, work, through all the different people who are uh, interested in this, we managed to get, we helped to get a state law passed that those leaks will have to be found and fixed. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna be doing is at the hackathon, we'll hopefully be trying to figure out a method for that's utility friendly for the utilities to measure the emissions off of each one of these uh, theoretically high volume leaks. Does that, so that, because uh, if we don't have feedback for the system, they're probably gonna find whatever leaks are convenient <laughs> and call those high volume and fix them because they don't know how to do it yet. Nobody does. How to, how to find the leaks, yeah. yeah. Have you checked on the response of a uh, national grid or other utilities by the capacity to, to repair these leaks and also we compare that to the new leaks that emerged that happened in the day? Um, yeah, I met with, uh, with a lot of other people, met with National Grid on, on Friday. Um, they say they will, they've hired a whole bunch of new people um, and they say they will have the capacity to do this to fix all these leaks. Um, but what I want them to do is be transparent about their information so that anybody, uh, so anybody can check that they fixed the right leaks, that the leaks were fixed, that, you know, so on and so forth. Because um, uh, the more transparency we have, uh, the more researchers can look at stuff and citizens can too. And is the color coding here the same? So red is fixed and yellow? No, in this case, I, I was mapping uh, the, the, the red, the, the pink ones are super emitters, the, the high volume gas leaks. The ye yellow ones are not. Um, they're just normal gas leaks. Um, Maybe I'll just add something about the community and science and the, the opportunities for just being creative here. Um, and, and I think it just is embodied by the collaboration that Audrey and I have so well, was to, to do this study, we had to think of methods that were a little out of the box, uh, a little bit uh, about fortu found objects, fortuitous stuff, because there's no real kit to measure gas leaks that you can buy from some, we were making this up as we go. So for example, we found out that the best kind of chamber to measure what's coming out of manholes is a turtle shell from a sandbox because it fits right over and it, it's a known volume and you get that for 20 bucks instead of having a machine shop make it for a thousand dollars right so so it's there's that level of creativity and just yesterday Audrey came up with the use of a pinwheel um, that might be able to mix the air um, that we need to measure and, and it's the kind of thing that it's like once she said that I was like yeah, perfect, you know, a pinwheel. Um, so I think in the hackathon, there, there will be um, opportunities to think about um, you know, how we might go about doing something in a cost-effective way um, without doing it kind of like, you know, NASA does in their, you know, multi-million dollar laboratories. Did you find uh, you had your test uh, going out with the truck and then you had the DPU uh, emissions data? Did you find any leaks that were not on the DPU national grid list? Oh yeah. <laughs> there, um, with with Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, Heat, my nonprofit, has done uh, a survey of uh, 15 different uh, municipalities, and uh, we found that the you are we found 1.7 times more leaks than the utilities reported, and there's lots of other stuff that we found that. Uh, makes us question uh, the utility data. Well, uh, Nathan, uh, I, uh, I'm aware of some of this work. Question and then uh, on a comment. Question, how do you know where the super emitters are now on your map, given that you're still in the process of measuring, as I understand? So, so we did the survey, the driving <laughs> survey, that measured 3,356 right. leaks in Boston. But that's just detecting leaks. That doesn't tell us how much is coming out. So then subsequently to that, we went out with these chambers. Some of them were the turtle shell. Yeah. Some of them were five gallon buckets with a slot cut out so it could go up to a curb because sometimes it comes out of these complex you know, um, geometries. Um, and so we, we did the laborious um, task of going back to 100 of those 3,356 leaks 
and measuring how much is coming out using this chamber technique. Um, and from that, the statistics of those 100 leaks show that seven of them accounted for 50% of the total lost gas. I so, see. So, so you've done a sample, but not comprehensive right. in any regard. Yeah. Exactly. You, it might be more like if we did the whole thing over again, maybe, you know, picked another 100 leaks, it may be that 10 of them accounted for 50%, right. no, was, or maybe no, six. It was a sample. It's right, a sample. It, it was a sample. Right, so it's okay. kind of a rough, we, we, we know that it's not like a bell-shaped curve and you've got an average leak and some are a little bit higher and some are a little bit lower. The distribution is a long tail. There's a few big ones. There's I don't have a lot of small now ones. Now my comp is anecdotal, but it's true. Uh, in one town that I was working with, I won't name the town, um, the report was that when they had a gas leak and the citizen complained enough that they would actually come out and fix the leak, but they didn't fix it well the first time they would sometimes have to come back and do it like five times. And the reason for that is that the gas companies get paid mm. based on the amount of work that they do. So if they do the same work over and over again, they get paid each time for it. Mm. So as you're engaging in this sort of measuring and monitoring, I do completely agree with the fact that some amount of, of oversight or review or checking up on ones that they say have been fixed would be a good part of the problem. Yeah, I, I think transparency and yeah. and watchdogs are good for any industry. Have you projected just, you know, in a dreamlike way, how much gas could be contained and how much that would reduce <coughs> any demand? So the best estimate that we have for the amount of lost gas uh, comes from a study that we did in collaboration with Harvard University, uh, Catherine McKay, Steve Wofsey, and, and their lab. Um, and we estimated that a little less than 3% of the amount of gas that's delivered into the service area is leaked out. Um, so that may not sound like a lot, you know, 3%, but because of the power of methane as a greenhouse gas, it has an outsized effect. And so that's why that 3% turns into about 10% of the total Commonwealth's greenhouse gas emissions inventory at that level. So if you, if, if you took that 3% leak gas down to zero, you'd save the Commonwealth 10% of its greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And about $90 million per year was the, the cost of the commodity at the time that the study was done. It's, gas is volatile, so that number changes. Yeah. But, th but there's another observation in that, which is that 3% just as itself would reduce the peak load demand for gas by 3%. And when they talk about the pipeline, they're increasingly talking about just a 5% deficiency in our peak load capacity right now. So you can definitely mitigate the need for a supposed need for the pipeline. That is an excellent, excellent point. Yeah. Are you here? And then there? So don't you have a problem of how you put all these dollars together? Because there's the ninety million dollars that I understand that the rate payer is paying the leak gas that we don't know about. We don't know what we're paying for. And, and then there's this fund that they have for fixing leaks. And then there's the, the amount of money that they're using for developing a new pipeline. And those are all coming out of different pocketbooks, I think. And it seems that if you don't figure out how to put them together about, okay, stop making us pay $90 million for waste of gas, let's use the $90 million and uh, fix the leaks, and then don't use the money that we're gonna build a pipeline for and fix the leaks. So how do you, I mean, because it's all about money at the end of the day. It's all anybody cares about. Companies and that people being mad at the public, uh, which ultimately is a money issue as well. So, if you thought about how you, how you do it, put those together. <laughs> um, I, uh, one of the things, uh, well, no, I mean, one of the things I think that's been, uh, that would be most effective is if the utilities had to pay for the cost of the last, of the lost gas. If they did, you know, as soon as they did, I think we'd see it a massive amount of repair happening a hell of a lot faster. 
Um, that that's what happened in in Texas. They passed a law saying that, and within uh, and I'm going to get this wrong now. Within three years, they had 50 percent of the leaks fixed. So it's it's just incentives. Um, what what I heard was on the day that the legislature, the, the end of the legislative session last year, when the energy omnibus bill was finally passed at uh, whatever two o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, a, a lot of I think that's when the provision that would include the incentives that, that the cost of the lost gas gets shifted to the companies was gone. Um, so there's a lot of lobbying going on over who's paying for the lost gas. So that's a problem. Well, but, but what you're saying is that's the first place to start. <clears throat> start by not taking the $90 million and using it to fix the leaks take 90 million dollars and say great pairs you keep it in your pocket and now the gas company's paying for it but that's a, that's a really simple any legislator can figure that out or any member of the public can figure that out if you get make it really simple and that was the provision well, that I know, but the public, that's the reason they got to do it in the middle of the night was that the public was asleep right exactly <laughs> yeah, just like when they admit the gas <laughs> <laughs> yep so with the infrastructure being this old uh, I'm worried that if you fix the leaks in one spot, because it's after it's due to pressure, it will just create leaks in other spots. And so, uh, we, so I mean, is, is, has there been any study of what happens when you fix the leaks? You want to take it over? Uh, we can both get an answer. <laughs> can, I, th I think. I think like a lot in Boston, a lot of the pressure in the pipes is about half pound per square inch. Mm -hmm. So fixing a leak in one spot is really not going to make any discernible difference. And that the, you know, the pressure is supposed to be maintained you know, evenly across the system. Otherwise, the people at the end of the line would not be getting any gas. So uh, I, there is the question that like hammering into the ground and moving stuff could potentially displace a little bit of, you know, mo move the joint of the pipe a teeny bit. Although I wonder if that's actually true. Your, your yeah, thought? Yeah, it's a pressure regulated system. So if you patch a leak, they're just going to turn down the flow to maintain this. So it's not going to induce a higher leak rate elsewhere. But it is a band-aid solution to patch, because every 12 feet on a cast iron uh, pipe is a joint, mm -hmm. and you often have a series of leaks. So then you're, ra then you're facing the question, do you uh, repair or replace? And there's a whole other set of considerations in terms of money and cost. Um, and, and I'm still very ambivalent about whether we should triage the system that we have as we transition to electrifying our heating system and making the transition to a clean energy, a non-fossil energy, or do we actually invest in replacing pipes that are going to be down for another 30, 40, 50 years? So it's a tough, it's a tough call. Is there technology, uh, they discussing technology and the composition of pipes that would be more long-term and less susceptible to it? Not really. I mean, Plastic is what's being put down now, and it's 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 not leaking because it's new. Um, do, I, they don't really know, as far as I know, how acids in the soil and weathering and all of these kinds of things. What you know, what the influence on the plastic will be. There's nothing inherently wrong with cast iron pipe, except it's old. If it was new cast iron pipe, I mean, of course, that's more energy intensive to make, but. It, it's really just the age factor, I think. Although I just want to say, like, I keep thinking, like, dentists can come up with stuff that, like, can fix teeth that are in, you know, saliva and acidic stuff and with, you know, under incredible pressure and stuff like that. Why can't anybody come up with something that would just coat the pipes on the inside? Um, so, you know, go ahead. <laughs> I was curious if, um, how, how, uh, Broad a number of people doing this sort of work um, you might have you know, across the country, other cities around the world. Do you in touch with folks? Uh, mostly Massachusetts. You know, I mean, the, the study we did in Boston was the first study of its kind in the world. So, so things started bubbling out from here, literally, I, I guess. Um, but, but. I, I think there's been a very strong, what we call the Gas Leaks Allies, the working group that we have that meets, is it once a month or once a week? Twi twice a month. Twice a month mm -hmm. is this core group, and Mothers Out Front has been amazing in terms of 
essentially um, keeping that and growing that network. Um, you know, you're seeing research communities and in, in other the science communities doing this work in, in other locations. I haven't quite seen the the, the network um, expand the way it has here. But the other interesting thing I think is that we're also realizing that there's this urban to rural interdependency, and so the pipeline issues connect us with you know rural Western Massachusetts and the um, the Kinder Morgan proposed pipeline going in there. Um, the pipeline that connects us in Boston to New York, <coughs> New Jersey, Connecticut, the uh, Algonquin incremental market, a spectra of pipelines that we are connected across the rural and urban communities by the same infrastructure. Um, so I, I think that the fossil fuel infrastructure expansion physically starts to organize a social network of resistance mm -hmm that is co-located with that, um, and that we're stronger when we, as people, s make the connections that are being made physically to resist it in a concerted fashion. Mm -hmm. One more just quick technology note. I read about it, and maybe you're going but apparently there's a new kind of robot that they have. The science yeah. That they can put into the pipes that can fix leaks from inside the pipe without having to shut the gas line down without having to dig up the streets. But they are, it's a phenomenally expensive robot, I guess. So, you know, that struck me when I read about it as a significant ray of hope that technology could once again come to the rescue here, so to speak. But if we had more robots, then it might be not so economically difficult for the utilities to, you know, deal with this uh, 20,000 odd leaks in their own Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, that robot they have to like dig down to put it in and it only has a limited expanse so it needs so much improvement it's uh, stunning to me maybe. I'm, I'm from Chile. I, I work for an oil company in Chile. It's an uh, operation company and not, not have an, uh, pipelines in, in, the, in the city but only the, the, the US track oil and gas. Uh, we detect uh, a lot of leak of methane operations and it was really really difficult to, to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy. Sometimes you, you you can measure in one corner but the, the leak is two blocks on the other side because they are moving around. And for from the perspective of the oil and gas uh, or utility companies, only the, the, the first of the, of the priority is for the explosion. Problem. Yeah, of this course. Is, this is the problem. No. It's not, I can save 2% or 4%, mm -hmm. or I can uh, save 5% uh, in the big way. But that's okay. This maybe starts the, starts the, the uh, good uh, effort to, to do the business better. But at the end, the explosion risk is heavy. And when, when the general manager or the manager of the some assets know that he has an uh, risk, explosion risk in the, in the area, He's really charged with this, with this product. If you put this information in the, in the, in the press, they will really move it to forward the soft product. Yeah. yeah. Completely sure. Yeah. Completely sure. If something happened, because they know, oh, yeah. if something happened, they will out the company. Completely sure. Yeah. Maybe it's an. I, I work for the old company, but yeah. I know when you yeah. have risk, yeah. right. detector risk, yeah. you need to take this risk into account. Yeah. If not, you are not good at work with that kind of company. I would agree with that. You know, and there's a nexus of issues associated with the gas leaks at the local scale, explosion risks, risks to vegetation and trees, that's local. Air quality degradation is more of a regional thing, and then there's a the, the, the global issue and they're all issues, and they should all be considered. Because yeah. um, um, after our Boston study, I remember that um, I was on uh, uh, Greater Boston, the TV show, and the, the co-panelist was the uh, Secretary of Energy and Environment for Massachusetts. And he said, he said, thank you for the work you're doing because you're giving me a, a, a way to make this issue, you know, because the explosion issue allowed him to push forward the climate change part of this. So, 
yeah, it's consistent with what you're saying. When you when you met the person for the first time working on the gas leak, did you that's Did you talk with him? Is he ever been talked to by somebody walking along? All and the time. <laughs> so why has the situation gotten to be like this? Uh, well, he's been, Bob Ackley has been a lone voice uh, for the last 30 years that who has been struggling to be not just the only person who has been calling this issue out. Uh, and uh, I think he feels, I don't want to speak for him, but, but that when people started to join with him, that's when I think he started to feel some level of vindication that it's not just it's not just me, you know, I'm, but that uh, and so as this network has grown larger, I, I think the changes are are the policy changes are happening because it's just everyone's seeing that this is a problem. But yeah, he's he's been struggling on his own for. I mean, he worked for the gas companies to do leak surveys. So for the most much of his career. Um, he was basically a worker for the gas company. Here's, you know, here's the leak reports. Here are the gas leaks, and he would notice trees were dying, and that the gas companies were not taking that seriously. They're like, well, we're not going to worry about that, and that really bothered him. So at some point, he defected and went out on his own because the trees were. He felt like his work wasn't being taken seriously. And so he's, he struck out on his own, um, but it, it you know it's one person, and these massive um, investor-owned utilities you know that uh, has made it very difficult. Thank you. I saw your latest map. You tweeted it. The Dedham. Yeah. That is that the new line. Yes. Yes. That's the West Roxbury lateral pipeline. Um, and that actually. Has leaks new. Yeah, I, so um, I'm going to just show it. Um, so we went out on Monday, Bob Ackley and myself and, and my son. And I, don't, I mean, I'm just going to, so you see these spikes, some, something like this, right? You see the red spikes. Um, and this is on a stretch of, it's East Street in Dedham, very close to Dedham Center, um, right by where the Boston and Providence uh, Turn pipe, not turn pipe, or whatever it's called, um, you know, the fast moving thing. Um, that stretch of East Street, which is about an eighth of a mile, is part of the pathway of the new West Roxbury lateral pipeline, which is a 750 pounds per square inch, two foot diameter transmission pipeline spur that has been part of Spectra Energy. It's their project to increase the gas flow into Boston. And what's really disturbing about what we found on Monday is that this is where, in the last year, they trenched that entire roadway and put this new pipe. Mm -hmm. And then they covered it up, paved new paving, new sidewalks, but they left leaking pipelines, the, the low pressure distribution pipelines, they left them leaking. And that's where there's all of these leaks, one after the other. Um, and so it was a missed opportunity. Uh, if you're going to dig up the street, don't leave 100-year-old pipe leaking pipelines there. Fix it. Um, there's already patches now in this new pavement, which are going to mean potholes are going to form soon. Were these leaks the spokes that run off that new pipeline, or were they in? No, they're, they're, uh, the, old, we, they're, they're, they're the old. They're the old distribution, low pressure pipelines that should have been fixed at the same time that they put the new pipeline in. Great. So two questions. One, um, what's the name of your instrument? Are we going to get to learn more about it? And then two, um, how does EPA rule for off A? impact any of this work? OK. Uh, yes, you get to go on the 31st. Um, oh, town. Darn. OK, well, we can arrange something on another occasion, I'm not sure. But you can get in the van. You can see that the picture that Audrey showed that it's, it's, um, it's called a cavity ring down spectrometer. Okay. That's the technology. Um, it's a laser technology. It has a little chamber in it 
that is evacuated down to about one fifth of a full vacuum. So it's got about 20% of the air molecules that you know normal air would have in it. So it's pulled down to that level. It's about a, like a one liter chamber. And in that chamber, there are three mirrors that are pointed at each other. And then they pulse a laser into that that is tuned to the absorbance, a unique absorbance span for methane. And it, that pulse of laser bounces around the three mirrors um, that's called ringing down. It's ringing in, in that thing and bouncing around. And the more concentration of methane there is in that air, the faster that pulse will decay to zero because the molecules of methane are absorbing. Uh, so if there's no methane in there, it'll, it'll take a long time for that thing to decay, that light pulse. And so that's the, that's the basic method for the cavity ring down spectrometer. Did you build that or did you buy no. it from like Princeton Instruments or something? Uh, the manufacturer is, for the instrument we used is called Picaro and they're based in Santa Clara. Um, the, the technology and the patents were mostly from Stanford University scientists. <laughs> Um, there's another firm that's doing a, the same basic kind of technology called Los Gatos out in uh, in, in that area of California as well. Um, you know, there's a few different flavors of, of this kind of measurement. So do you think that there's, because this is an expensive instrument, right? right. Yeah. How much does it cost? Uh, this one was about 60K. 60, 65K. So yeah. I'm thinking more in the community science direction. We. I think cheap lasers are becoming available, right? And right. while the, maybe the mirror configuration might be the expensive um, piece there, is there a way to combine maybe pulse lasers and using data analytic techniques to do a much cheaper job? Well, do you want to ask? I'm doing all the talk. Go, go ahead. Oh, I'm okay. happy. Well, I'm I'll, <laughs> I'll just say that I'm going to come back to I some comment right where, like MIT, the, the, the people here, it's like the robot thing. Yeah, we should have swarms of little tiny robots <laughs> fixing pipelines. And MIT is a great community to, to, to come up with those kinds of solutions. And then, as well, um, low-cost sensors that could could do this would be would unlock opportunities for a much wider group of people to be doing this stuff. And I, and I don't think they all have to be expensive. Like there's this one technology where it's just something that goes on the pipe seal, you know, between the two joints, because that's where most of the leaks come from. And if that is uh, that link is broken, it tells the office. Like that's a simple, you know, <laughs> let's do something simple like that. That's not expensive. That's not hard. When you can, you can uh, detect the, the leaks in the, in the operations, we use an infrared camera. Yeah. And you can you can see the flows, but you can you, you couldn't uh, measure the flows. Again, right. You can see maybe less flows or more. Yeah. And it's more qualitative. Yeah, but, but you can see. Yeah. You put they put uh, two videos. Yeah. In a normal camera and the infrared camera, you can see. I just oh, want to very briefly mention that uh, uh, the political part of this, the town of Brookline has now passed two resolutions uh, opposing natural gas pipeline expansion in Massachusetts. We're the first uh, community to do such a thing that where there, a pipeline was not scheduled to go through, you know, in our boundaries. So, uh, and we'd be happy to uh, Brookline town meeting to look into the issue of somehow pressuring the gas companies to uh, you know, more speedily address the issues in you know, the leaks in, in, in our town, kind of a general pressure thing to help your issue. I think that's something that Mother's Earth Front is already uh, onto. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I, we want that. Yeah. <laughs> the more pressure they have, the more everybody takes it seriously, as it should be. So we have three more sessions on the 23rd, which is the coming Monday. We have a hackathon, and again, we will be playing with probably two different ways of hacking with this data. One is more data-centric, more uh, code-centric. The other might be uh, more design threat centric So, it so depending visualizing. On, so visualizing the data. Again, depending on what your interests are, you can do one or the other. Do sign up on the client site if you haven't already done so. Uh, the other. Uh, the next session on the 31st is driving around town and uh, smelling. 
So I think that that's going to be what we're going to be doing. And finally, on the first, we will come back together and say, what can you know, communities and citizens working with scientists do with this? Can you take this to court? What? So how do you build an ecosystem that addresses these challenges and not just do it individually?